on at every time outside of the auditorium too. Uh, just um, put it down only for eating or drinking, please. Another indications that are important, uh, the exits are right over here and the one in the back, that's important. And also I want to remind you that this event um, is a hybrid event. So please share your thoughts on social media and make everyone in, um, in the virtual symposium uh, part of the conversation. So take the debate outside of these walls, please. Um, so finally, we are here uh, on our third day. Are you excited? for the third day, yay, me too. So um, yesterday we spoke about uh, environmental issues. You get to know a little bit more about ecosystems here in Chile and also about uh, wildfires management and ecopreneurs um, and other interesting topics. So. I hope that you like those and learn from them. Um, and today we are moving forward a second to a second very important topic of the um, sustainability paradigm that's uh, society and governance. So governance, governance is the way that society articulates and works through institutions and laws um, to work for an objective. So as it's super important for all of the people in the world to work together and to try to understand each other for making changes, uh, the first session will be an international conversatory about governance uh, in an international scale. So for that, I would like to introduce to you um, the one and only <laughs> Alina Lehikoinen. He is the head of the subcommission of uh, FAO in IPSA. So welcome her, please. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and night to everyone who is joining us online from different time zones. Uh, I am Alina Lehikoinen. I am the current head of FAO subcommission, as well as a former IFSA president. And you've also maybe seen me speak about things such as YFPD. So I currently wear quite a few hats in IFSA. Um, I am here joined by today for this panel on uh, international governance uh, by Nick Nugent, Taya Cisneros, and Peter Van Lierop, uh, who are going to present themselves in a very moment, as well as Salina Abraham, who is not on the, uh, on the screen yet, but uh, on our computer already. Uh, and hopefully we'll get her so that you can see her as well very soon. Uh, but I'm gonna start, oh yes, and one uh, thing before people get to present themselves is that we are going to have uh, time for audience questions as well in this panel after some discussions from our side. Uh, and there is the QR code where you can, through Menti, submit your questions. All right. Then we can start maybe from right to left. So Nick, you can start by presenting yourself, telling who you are and uh, what organizations you are from. Perfect. Thank you, Alina. And uh, I just want to thank Alina, but also all the organizing committee and my co-panelists for being here. This is really uh, an honor for me. So thanks for having me. My name is Nick Nugent. Uh, I'm a master's student at the Yale School of the Environment studying climate change and nature-based solutions. Um, I'm originally from the United States. Uh, it's my first time in Chile, Chile, and I'm super excited to be here. Um, I have spent a lot of time in my career working 
um, in uh, on kind of dialogue initiatives first in Peru uh, after I graduated uh, from my undergraduate, and then I started working in clean energy, microfinance, and carbon credits. So that involved a lot of stakeholder interaction, um, and now. I'm back in school again, and uh, happy to be here. So thanks for having me. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Natalia Cisneros, but most of you uh, probably know me by Daya. That's what I usually go by. Um, I am, I'm going to copy your format for an introduction. So I am working as a researcher in, um, in a research organization. It's called C4, many of you may know it. It's a NIFSA partner, it's the Center for International Forest Research. Um, and I focus on governance, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and I work with multi-level uh, and multi-stakeholder governance. And like, well, it's a term that's really abstract, but it's called political ecology, which basically means, you know, the behind the scenes in, in, in conservation, land use, land use change, um, like what are the like different power? Um, well, we'll be talking more about this later, but um, it's like the non-technical aspects of conservation. It's not my first time in Chile, but I'm always really excited to be here. And I will also be talking about some of the experience that I've been doing with the University of Cambridge on precisely multi-level governance. So yeah, excited to be here. Hello, sorry for the mic, it doesn't seem to work. I'm uh, Peter van Leop. I have studied uh, tropical forestry or tropical silviculture in, uh, pa in the past century at the University of Wageningen in, uh, in the Netherlands. I understood there were some more people from Wageningen here studying there. Um, uh, after that, I've spent some years working for international cooperation, both for the Dutch Corporation and for FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations which has a specific branch on, on forestry. I've worked some time at headquarters in Rome there, working only in issues like uh, forestry education and fire management. And over the last eight years, I've been working at our regional office in, uh, first the sub-regional office in Panama for Central America, and now here in the regional office in Panama over the last three years. Uh, which means that I'm not working really as a specialist on any of the, my former areas of work. Uh, I'm supposed to be a generalist, and whenever I need support from specialists, I can call on my colleagues in headquarters. So I'm not really what you would call a, a specialist in, uh, in governance, but of course, with all my work in forestry, we have to deal a lot with this issue of uh, governance. Thank you. And now we finally also have Salina so that the audience can see her as well. Uh, so welcome, Salina, once again. And can you uh, present yourself shortly?
organization. Uh, and maybe we can start with Salina first now. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Um, Ty, I'm looking right at you, so I'm gonna use you as my, my marker, perfect. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting question, because yeah, Ty had said it's, it's, a, it's a vague um, concept, it's a bit of a, a, a boring word, you know, if you're looking at it from a communication side. Um, but if, yeah, to me, I guess it's the basis under which we make progress in society. Um, and it's either an opportunity really to enable citizens and, and other actors to get involved in shaping their own future, or sometimes it's, you know, an, an example of how you can reinforce existing power dynamics and ensure that the direction of progress is set out by those who are, you know, benefiting from the current situation. Um, and so, you know, when I've been thinking about from around the world and bring these viewpoints into the UN forum. So that's a big ask. Uh, how do you then think about how you create change and, and, and play out that, that role? Um, so then the second question is, okay, what are, what are my limitations? Who's deciding, right? In this UN forum, countries decide. So, okay, I have a responsibility here and I'm gonna do my best to do that, but ultimately I don't make a decision, right? So how can I encourage and create change in this context? Is it the most efficient way to draft text, uh, propose new ideas? Do I need to find a country who's gonna be an ally here and the things that I wanna push for? Um, how, what am I pushing for? What do youth around the world uh, want to see, right? What, what do I feel comfortable advocating for? So these are the questions that um, I feel like I very early on in IFSA started to to start to ask and answer together. Um, and it's something that continues on, right? So I think when I took the next step to think about, I, I'm a young person leading a youth initiative and organization, you know, who are the people that are perhaps underrepresented? Um, what long-term changes can I make here um, that will allow for a better and more inclusive outcome? Um, you know, and now when I work at the Global Landscapes Forum, which is a, uh, a, a platform that is housed by C4, uh, you know, and it's a partner where, where Taya works, um, but has an, a, a desire to be a platform for everyone um, and that isn't really owned by anyone. What new forms of, of governance are, do we want to embody that also address the, you know, the challenges and limitations that currently exist? How do we disrupt the status quo and build this model um, and engage indigenous peoples and young people and grassroots uh, organizations and, and uplift their perspectives in order to you know, create the situation that we would like. So I think for me, um, governance is a really important question that I think illuminates um, a lot of the challenges that we have and, and really the structural issues that are at the root of them. Um, and hopefully what we'll be able to talk about in this conversation is, you know, um, where power tends to lie um, and our relationship with those entities. and. You know, many of us are apathetic or distrustful of governments. Um, the majority of African youth, with the exception of Rwanda and Ghana, 
feel that their country is going in the wrong direction. Um, so I'm excited to have this conversation to be able to talk about, you know, what's the role that we all play in this context and, and the vital and important kind of function that we have in, in creating the change that uh, we want to see. Um, but yeah, that's that's it for me. Thank you. That already went to. I'm uh, very happy to hear about the views on your and perspectives of how you experienced experienced it as IFSA and as youth when you were doing it, um, as well as now. Uh, maybe Peter next. Okay. Thank you. Well, maybe first a bit more more formal idea. I think what if you talk about governance, what you're mostly talking about are about rules and processes formal or informal, which are established so that all stakeholders, one way or another, uh, can coordinate their activities related to the forest uh, uh, conservation, forest use, forest management, etc. Uh, you can look at this also at uh, all kinds of different levels. You can look how to deal, uh, what does it mean for local populations in a, in a forest reserve or in a protected area, or how do you involve the local communities within your, uh, your forest management plan? But you also have had at other levels, like you have the whole, uh, in Europe, the, the European Union's Forest Law Enforcement Governance and, and Trade Action Plan, or FLAGT, as this called, or the whole program which is looking at how to make sure that in Europe the wood which is sell, is sold does not come from illegal sources. Uh, other issues maybe a bit more is also is the whole red program, the, the reduced uh, emissions through deforestation and degradation uh, programs, whereby you're looking for uh, payment schemes to uh, to promote forest uh, management. So what I would like to say, so you can look at the whole governance issue at very very dip, at all different levels, but the end what you're talking about is trying to to find mechanisms whereby the different stakeholders. Uh, uh, can participate in, in, in management or policy related to forestry. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to see we have a very excited audience uh, clapping after each um, each speaker. Uh, Taya next. <laughs> Right. Um, so I was actually talking to Tim yesterday and he mentioned that he hears this word governance all over the place, but like, you know, it's one of those things that's just thrown out there and we don't really know what it's about. So I think before I continue, um, I'd like to know how many of you have heard this word, but like are just beginning to understand what it is or, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> um, for me and my own personal view of this, I like to think of governance as the behind the scenes um, that is made because in the end, well, forests and landscapes, they are about people. So it's the people aspect of this, like, you know, how decisions are made and how people are involved. And, you know, like Selena was saying, like, who makes these decisions, how and why? And like for me, and one of the crucial aspects of my work is looking at who has, like, who has power, and in the first place, like, is power even identified, like, power imbalances, and try to figure out, like, okay, where inequity lies and how to leverage the playing field for especially minority groups um, that tend to be given, like, a token representation in many spaces, but it's not real and effective participation, and how to make real and effective participation actually happen. Um, so it's all of these, well, I wrote down a series of questions, um, but like also, right, how transparent processes are. Um, so it's, it's, it's the, again, like behind the scenes of what we tend to think is a very technical process, but it cannot be um, taken away from, it goes hand in hand with the social and political aspects, which often go unaddressed and which directly influence these technical process that will be seen as the like outcome most of the times, right? Um, so in my work, not only do I study uh, governance, but it's also interesting to, to witness a governance process as part of like the work that I'm immersed in. Like for example, um, we, we do studies and then we get um, 
recommendations uh, rooted in science on what some of these things are that need to be worked on for practitioners and for decision makers like at the local, regional, national government or international government. Um, but then governance is also seen when you try to to relate with these like sometimes government um, people who are making decisions because willpower is involved in there as well. Like, you know, how interest how interested is a certain stakeholder who is in uh, the, the head of an organization in making this change really happen, right? So it's it's very abstract, but it's also very connected to so many other aspects uh, of like the typically unseen or um, I would say like invisible factors that we need to look at to make the processes actually work. And we were talking uh, before also with Nick um, on how many times we focus on the outcomes, which are really shaped by the processes. So governance is really about how these processes happen, basically. Um, at least for me, uh, I think like beyond the technical explanation, I just wanted um, to think of like how how it is applied um, and in nice and simple terms. Um, that's also my take from it. There's different aspects, of course, but yeah, um, that's it for me. Yeah, I think that's a very good short introduction uh, for those who are not that familiar with it. And also to tell Salina, who probably cannot see the audience, it was maybe half who raised their hand to Taya's question. <laughs> um, but Nick, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're already jumping right into the meat of it. And so I'm just going to echo uh, Tayana and Selena and say that everything really does, I feel like, come down to power dynamics in these situations in any kind of governance or decision making or participation process. Um, and so recognizing that at the outset and managing for that and being conscious of that is critical. And so even on a personal level, that's something that I have to be conscious about right now, right? As a white man from the United States, I definitely have certain power dynamics that I bring to this conversation of whether or not, you know, uh, or how I need to manage those personally, that's my responsibility, but then to have an effective conversation um, that needs to be recognized, right, by me personally and by all stakeholders. And so um, professionally, uh, I should have mentioned this in my introduction, but I'm working with an organization called the Forest Dialogue, uh, which is a nonprofit organization housed at Yale University, but also independent at the same time, um, that uh, basically designs multi-stakeholder, international multi-stakeholder dialogue platforms uh, that have to do with issues in the forestry sector. So essentially we're aimed at reducing conflict among forestry stakeholders uh, by bringing everybody to the table, trying to manage for power dynamics, trying to create as power neutral an environment as possible, which some of you probably know is a really difficult, if not impossible task. Um, but bringing everybody to the table so that we can openly identify uh, what certain fracture lines are, we, we refer to them as fracture lines, and then try to work together to identify what a proposed solution or some sort of, uh, you know, movement toward positive action or change can be in regards to those fracture lines. And so the reason why I said that in kind of a convoluted way is again to echo Taya, the forest dialogue or TFD for short um, is really process driven and process oriented. And we have no say in the outcome. Because how can we? We're here to develop a process, create a space with a specific amount of time, uh, a certain amount of people that come together to talk about something. And what the outcomes are, is, are is, that's completely up to the stakeholders, right? Which, as a lot of you can imagine, also makes for kind of a funny funding situation because we're a nonprofit. We, we get funding from our donors and uh, you know, they're not funding any outcomes, which a lot of them are used to doing. They're just funding a process. Um, and so we bring that process it's, that's evolved over the years, um, doing, I think, over 80 dialogues in over 30 countries. Um, you know, we, we were founded in the year 2000, and uh, actors from civil society and private, se private sector, business leaders in the forestry uh, industry, 
decided there was a need for a forum where they could come together to talk out some of these issues. And I think that forum was there uh, at UNFF and even GLF, you know, create great spaces for dialogue. But I think this specific space for civil society and the private sector to really talk honestly about their issues was uh, the need of the hour. And so uh, Peter brought up RED. I think TFD was very instrumental uh, kind of at the beginning of RED Plus and bringing people together to talk about the opportunities, some of the threats or uh, fears that people had about the process. Um, and so that was an important early dialogue for TFD. Um, but we're doing dialogues all over the world. And really the process, the way we see governance is a process. And that process is identifying stakeholders, doing a stakeholder mapping, making sure that every diverse perspective is included, uh, that we reach out to those people and we discuss which, with each of them their particular, uh, you know, their particular um, issues or opportunities around either a theme in forestry or a particular landscape where there's been um, a history of, of kind of problems. So um, we identify stakeholders, we scope the issue, working with each stakeholder to say, to identify what their main concerns are. We then kind of consolidate those fracture lines. We publish a document that's available to the public, but more importantly to all the stakeholders that are going to be invited to the actual dialogue. We have a scoping dialogue where we confirm that these are the issues people want to talk about. And then we move on to the final stage, which is an on-site field dialogue, where we bring all those stakeholders to the landscape or to the area where the issue is happening. And we have a predetermined list of uh, fracture lines that we're going to cover. And we have a very clear process for how we're going to cover those. And uh, you know that's, that's generally how we work, but each dialogue is very different. So it's a, it's a rigid process that has to also be very flexible for each particular situation. So um, on a personal level, you know, it's about power dynamics and how power dynamics influence decision making and even the kind of uh, vibe of a conversation, if you will, um, in those decision making processes. And then at a professional level, it's really about designing and implementing a process. It's very much process oriented and the outcome is to be determined. I just want to add something there. I've realized we've been mentioning the word stakeholder as well. Um, I did too, and I think many of us did. Um, so that might also be a new term for many of you. And just we were just checking our jargon before getting here because we do work with these words. So like for those of you who may not be familiar with this term, um, a stakeholder is basically like an actor of the landscape. So it can be a group of you can say like government actors or like people who have a similar interest or, you know, uh, international NGOs, maybe like a stakeholder group can also be like cattle ranchers or so just leaving that out there in case like we're confusing you with like really jargony terms. Um, excuse our language. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that addition. Uh, and I think we can move on to more specific questions on each of your um, each of your work. Uh, and I wanted to start with Peter, as you work with uh, such an well, all of you work with international organizations or processes, but this is but FAO is considered as a high level organization, uh, and maybe you can bring some background with it. Uh, and uh, how do you involve local and traditional communities in your programs as well as how can you evaluate the impact of the implementations of these multi-level and multi-stakeholder initiatives? Okay, thank you, uh, Alina. Um, yeah, there's always a bit of a tricky question. I think for me there are roughly two different areas there. there are, we always work, if we start to develop activities, it's always on the demand of a country. And there, it's already tricky if you talk about governance. Because if you, if you speak with a country, it is normally the other ministries. That's one of the stakeholders, not all of them. So the all that there becomes the whole complication of how, how do we go on that? Now, a country might ask to um, help develop specific activities for a certain group. I don't know, uh, people living in a forest or nearby a forest, indigenous communities. Or they won't ask for this. They would just want to make sure that a forest is better managed or have a better forest policy. Well, within FAO, we also have a specific uh, policy, for instance, on indigenous people. 
uh, and that's not only for the forestry sector, that's for all, for all our activities, which obliges us in whatever activities we do, if there are indigenous people, for instance, involved in that region, and the work might affect those indigenous people, we are obliged to start before any activity starts with a, a certain process, which, and I have to look it up because it's always a complicated name, which we call the free, prior, and informed consents. What does it mean? That means that before doing anything, uh, we are supposed to present the proposed activities and discuss with those local people uh, what we're supposed to do and get to an agreement on, uh, on, on these activities. Do they agree on this or not? And will be a discussion on how we maybe can adjust, etc., the, the programs in such a sense. So it means that, that even if we're working at the highest level, because we're supposed to be an organization which works for the, uh, its member countries, so member countries automatically think about your government, your ministries, and things like that. You also have to deal with those other stakeholders, which often becomes, uh, uh, it's not easy, but it always might be a big, um, uh, I should, a, a big challenge or a big opportunity. For instance, I've been working many years on the issue of uh, forest fires or fire management, and then we found out that in reality, without involving those com com local communities or even starting from their perspective, it's very little you can do in many cases. So, for us, it's very important to have specific attention for those groups and also make sure that from the beginning of any activity, we have that uh, specific program, that uh, consent. Now, how do you evaluate the impact? Yeah, that's always a very tricky thing because uh, programs, and it's, they are shorter and shorter each time. Uh, if you're lucky, you have programs now where you can work during five, six years maybe in the same region with the same people. So then during the process, which we normally are obliged to do is that you have an evaluation at the beginning, your, your stock taking or your baselines. During the whole process, you would have a midterm evaluation to look at the impact, whereby you try to discuss again with all the different stakeholders or actors in the, in the process, and you would have a final evaluation. Now, where the problem often is, is and what happens afterward. In reality, at the specific level of all those activities or projects, you cannot evaluate what has happened over 10 years. But you have things like uh, the Global Forest Resource Assessment, which uh, comes out each five years, whereby traditionally it would be a lot about um, how many hectares of forest have disappeared this year in each country, how many new uh, forests have been uh, planted, etc., etc. So it would be very statistical on the more physical side of the work. But lately in the last uh, Global Forest Resource Assessments, we also have specific categories related to governance. So that's more or less the kind of evaluation which we can do, and which is clearly not perfect. Well, I think um, it's difficult to be perfect. Not many things in this world are perfect, but trying and probably developing and getting better as well, hopefully. Uh, and Taya, uh, you are researching local communities. Uh, so, and well, the governance. Uh, so, how do these local communities then relate to international policy programs? And do these actually um, help solve problems uh, on the local levels? Um, that's a very good question. So, um, I guess I want to echo some things that have already been said. Um, I think the problem with like if you look at international governance, you have you have international people, then you have like national stakeholders, then regional, then you have the local communities, and they all have like sometimes different interests or needs and realities. And there is a big gap with international processes in ensuring true and effective participation and really seeing them as equal partners. There is a lot of paternalism in the world, in the world of conservation and natural resources um, and seeing them as like, oh no, maybe the people who will be implementing the solutions or like, you know, bringing these to happen uh, on the ground. Uh, but many of these people are not really involved um, from the start in the right way in a co-designing process just like i mean peter you brought free prior informed consent and i think that is that is crucial like free in terms of like you know 
is it free to give? Are people really giving it or is it, you know, coerced? Is it informed? Like, does it bring uh, information of the good things and the bad things that could happen? Like, are they really given consent or, you know, so, so it's really complex. And in, in some of my research, I've seen that this is done as a tick box exercise and not really done in depth enough. So then you are legitimizing a process that may actually not really be free prior informed consent, you know? Um, so I guess many processes are disguised as participatory, which can create much more harm. And there is another problem that is that I've seen, um, that is many, okay, so where do these projects come from? Like I've seen international donors, um, without giving any names, that have really good intentions, but they have assumptions of what is needed at the local level or like not really understanding the social context or the like social cultural norms. Um, so some of these of these projects or initiatives, like I, 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 I question myself, like whose interests are actually being addressed with this? Is it like um, your interest to bring forward a solution, but is this solution considered a solution by the local people? Um, I remember this, this, it's a funny story. Um, there was this international uh, organization that uh, wanted to tackle uh, malnutrition in the Amazon and they gave powdered milk to people there, but that was not in, like they never had powdered milk before. And they were really excited to get like all of this white powder and they used it to delimit the, the football field in the community because that was just not done accordingly to like what was actually needed there, you know? Um, so I guess a question that I have for like, again, it can be very well intended, but like who gave you the legitimacy, and I'm using this word again, and I'll probably use it again later, um, that your solution is actually the best solution, you know, whose solution is it and who is it for? Um, and we've talked about power also before, but for me, it's also addressing power imbalances, especially because decisions in this landscape um, are seldom really made by the people who inhabit these places. Um, so in, what, in, in the research that I conducted last year, for example, there was this global conservation initiative uh, that aimed to, to safeguard biodiversity in the world. Um, but when talking to local stakeholders, many of them perceived this to be an imposed solution. Um, they didn't even know, uh, like they thought like these, these people are going to take my land away. Uh, so it just goes, you know, like the fear that, okay, maybe in this case, free parent parent consent wasn't really done and not enough time was spent in building these relationships again as true partners and they were just counting on them to implement the solutions. Um, and in this case, then this also backfires because in this case, this uh, conservation mechanism was about identifying biodiversity and biodiverse important places. And then the local people themselves would take into their hands the conservation. But if you're enhancing mistrust and some of these places have like a very deep historical history of rightful narrations and all of these things. So like in the end, you may be spending a lot of time and energy and like financial resources and all kinds of, of, of resources and something that is doomed to fail in the end. So um, there's a problem with your, there's so many wicked problems that need to be addressed, you know, climate change, biodiversity laws, inequity, and if we're using these opportunities um, and not addressing the, like for example, participation and real participation in the right way, then we are maybe losing the chance of having these perceived as you know, effective and actual solutions. Um, then people like, you know, maybe donors are going to go like, well, you know, maybe let's not finance these things because like they're not going to work. We've seen the evidence, but it's not because the idea wasn't a good one. It was just like, you know, it was not implemented in the right way, respecting again, like social and political norms maybe. Um, and oh, and this is something that also came across in, in the research that I thought was really interesting, that many of these were, were, were considered to be as imposed colonialism and like as a modern way of, 
of like, you know, colonization in the conservation world. Like, you know, why is a person from the USA, sorry, Nick, nothing against you, but like, this is something that came up in my research, um, making decisions on my landscape, you know, like, are these people taking our resources again? So um, I think it's really important to address these power dynamics and like to humbly say like, okay, maybe these are my solutions. What about what their solutions are? And let's co-design them and be more like uh, an enabling factor rather than, you know, the bringer of all solutions. Um, and oh, it, this, so if I, if I start talking about like, you know, inequity and governance and local people, then uh, you need to shut me up uh, after a while. Like I have so much to say about this. Um, but uh, in terms of your second question, um, if these are not done the right way, you may actually exacerbate inequity gaps or uh, you may create new problems or aggravate existing ones. Like for example, if I'm mainstreaming participation and I say like my process is participatory and I will bring um, an indigenous woman to the table and she will make sure that, you know, this is a, a participatory and truly inclusive process. But maybe this woman, she doesn't understand the technical language. She doesn't have the confidence to speak up. Uh, she fears being laughed at. Uh, so she will not speak up and decisions will be made that maybe go um, against what this indigenous woman really needs. So her presence in that decision space actually serves to, again, sorry for the word, but to legitimize an outcome that is actually playing against her. So like these are really, really tough dangers that we really need to be aware of. Um, and again, like the, the, the mistrust that can be avoided by just bringing them in in the right moment before this turns into, into like I've seen really, really good projects that had really good intentions, but they just failed to engage in the right intensity and in the right moment. Um, so I think it's mostly that, right? And even like a message for, for us to check our own biases, like maybe we think we know and we want to support, but like, you know, how much is, it, are they even asking for a support, you know? So, so yeah, food for thought. Um, and there may be a lot of also really strong technical solutions but which depend on these, like, like I was mentioning before, the, the unseen, the often invisible social and political things that, that define the success of your technical solution, right? So again, like we've been saying before, and, and Nick just mentioned, like the process um, and how it's made and not maybe speeding things up, but like doing things slowly and consciously. Um, yeah, that was maybe a lot, and I'll stop there. And you feel free to stop me if, if you feel like I'm overdoing it, because I could talk about this for ages. Thank you. These, for sure, are very interesting, very interesting work you're doing and views that you can teach us from that. Uh, but moving a bit from local communities to civil society, uh, I would like to ask Salina, uh, why is it important to share different types of knowledge with the civil society and what is the actual work behind the scenes for making this knowledge have an impact? Thank you so much, Alina. Thank you to all the panelists. It's been really a, uh, a great conversation. I don't think we talk about this enough, probably. Um, and I guess to answer your question, um, and maybe to also preface uh, something that's underlying at um, in in all of this, which is you know we're we're trying to get to an outcome, and we try to get to the most efficient way to get to the outcome. And mostly the, that most efficient way to do it is probably not the like the most inclusive way to do it. Um, and what I think I think everyone should interrogate internally is your beliefs on this point because. Um, you know, we do understand there's a point of diminishing returns when you have too many people in a room and you're trying to have a conversation. Um, if so, I have assessed can be a great example of this sometimes, um, you know, where you see the challenges of, of bringing everyone in and trying to hear everyone's viewpoints and how you may end up, um, you know, 
struggling to move forward. And so I find that um, underlying all of this is, is, you know, many times people's individual belief systems around what's the most efficient way to get to an outcome and how many people do I actually want in the room and who do I think is competent enough to represent and all of that um, creates the chaos. <laughs> I believe that, you know, it is playing out in the world today. And so I'm a genuine believer in kind of the process. Um, and I understand that, you know, it can slow things down, but it's, it's very important to, um, for us to have the conversation on what are the best practices on these issues? What are, you know, what are those processes in place that we all would advocate for and say, this is, this is what we, how we should do it. Um, so I think that's just an important um, thing for us to consider. So, then, yeah, when you think about civil society, right? Why civil society? Um, I think going back to who holds the power, who holds the right to decision making is really important um, because I didn't understand the role of kind of sovereignty and how we over prioritize governments um, in global policies, in, you know, funding that goes to climate, um, in, in just interpreting and thinking about, you know, who's supposed to create change in this world the current systems, you know, have decided it's government. So that's great, um, but we understand there's many strong limitations to that. So when you start to think about what's the role of civil society here, um, I think for, for GLF, um, we view civil society as a, like a critical driving force, right? We're trying to work with those who are driving action on the ground or others who may be well-meaning and curious and interested in, in supporting that type of action. Um, I don't think we, we don't aim to, to serve governments in any way, but that's because many of our formal, formal institutions already do that. The, um, you know, many, whether that's the World Bank, whether that's, you know, um, funding for climate, whether that's Jeff or GCF, or the Global Climate, um, you know, fund, you, there's a lot of money and emphasis and conversation going to governments. There's, there's an underemphasis in terms of, you know, who are the people who are actually end up doing the great work. And so I think from GLF side, we try to think of how can we become an accelerator of best practices, a place in a space where people can come in and say, you know, these are the, um, this is what's worked for me. This is what hasn't. Um, and, and somehow, you know, our belief, I think, is that by creating the space for people to connect, share, learn and act, that that spontaneous interaction allows people to make better um, decisions. And then that collation of like, okay, what are these best practices then at a regional level? Or, um, you know, what are the key issues that we all feel like we need to be diving into more deeply? And how can we then better inform the existing uh, processes that uh, are in place? So that's the backdrop of what I'm thinking about as I'm hearing this conversation. Um, and so when we think about providing knowledge to civil society or how to best do that, um, I think it's not necessarily about information and awareness raising um, with the hope of having more informed citizen, but it's more so about generating a conversation, right? So how can we have a, a enough connection and touch points and, and interaction that we feel that people come out of it um, with new perspectives and new knowledge, new resources, new networks to be able to take the action in the direction that they've decided is necessary. Um, so I think that's really our, um, how we, we want to see impact. And so the behind the scenes work is identifying who are those change makers, uh, whose voices are we not listening to, um, and thinking about, can we create more, um, can we create a new environment, you know, that feels almost a little bit free of, um, you know, how we tend to perceive tackling these environmental issues. And so can we create a space where perhaps a policymaker is going to listen and, and, and just hear, and that other people can feel empowered and, to be able to speak their truths and their voice and, and create, you know, um, a new way of sharing knowledge and a new emphasis on whose knowledge is, is uh, deemed as important enough to action on. Um, so I think that's always what's underlying the work um, that, you know, we've been doing at the Global Landscapes Forum, which is who thinking about those power dynamics and how we temporarily create a space where um, it's flipped and it's it's different. And so that we hope that that contributes um, to, to real and tangible change. And so 
um, I wouldn't underestimate the the real um, impact that spaces like that can have. Um, and I think the the work behind the scenes for making sure that this knowledge has an impact um, is a lot more than you think it would be, right? And so I, I think then the question is, so for example, from my side, you know, you're starting a, you're starting to think about how can we as the Global Landscapes Forum create change uh, in, in the African continent? So who are the stakeholders that are already taking actions? You know, what knowledge have they already uh, been gathering? So all of these conservation and development organizations, what have they been doing? What do they feel like needs to be elevated and, and, and we, that we need to have a conversation about even further? So we start to then think about, okay, what, what are the governance processes we need in place to make sure that there is, as Taya was talking about, legitimacy here? Um, and then that's when I would caution everyone, is as you start to go about this, there's, there's the dream and then there's the reality, the practical limitations of your time, your resources, and that's when people tend to start cutting corners and saying, okay, Yes, we've created a process here where we have partners who come together. We have a, a committee of people who we come to and we get their advice. Um, and I, I'm always interested in how people perceive these spaces, right? Do you actually genuinely feel that the advice that you're getting um, is what you should action on? Or do you try to stipulate, manipulate and facilitate a situation, right? Um, where you're getting the outcome that you desire. And so I think that I'm excited that Nick is going to speak after this because I think the facilitation and um, uh, strategy component, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thin line. And you have to be really careful at how do you say, okay, I'm going to um, create this space that I, you know, is going to see the desired outcome, but that I'm not losing integrity um, here. And so... That's just one thing that is on my heart as we're talking about this, because that's the these are the practical situations when you become a leader or you sit in a in a you know a position of power, you that you have to ask yourself is like how am I going to actually navigate these? Um, so yeah, I'm going to maybe pass it over to Nick to share more because um, that's the stakeholder dialogues are oftentimes where that fun plays out and and where you sit in the that seat and think about how do I actually navigate this in real time? Um, but yeah. That's all, that's all I have for now. Thank you. And also thank you for the segue you already gave us uh, for Nick's questions um, on the first dialogue. Um, so Nick, uh, how do you manage to facilitate, facilitate spaces of discussion for the different stakeholders to engage uh, comfortably and share their concerns and what is the final product of the main objective that you actually aim through through the first dialogue thank you alina and yes thank you selena because that's uh well there's so much to talk about and i feel like the more i think about this stuff the less sure i am how to talk about it <laughs> unfortunately um but uh selena's mentioned a few points ty has mentioned a few points that are making me think um, Taya talked about coercion, uh, which is a really interesting uh, form of power. And uh, also Taya talked about tokenism, which I think is something that must be avoided at all costs, but is also pretty complex and tends to play out more frequently uh, than it should, I would think. Uh, excuse me. And Selena talked about uh, how we over-prioritize governments sometimes. And I think that's a really uh, interesting thing to touch on um, that I'll get to in a bit. And then she also talked about manipulation uh, and facilitation. So I think, I think the forest dialogue uh, uses the word facilitation infrequently, or if we do, we talk about it kind of as lowercase f facilitation, as opposed to this very formal uh, uppercase f facilitation. Um, and I think the reason we do that is for precisely what Selena is saying. We do not want to manipulate the direction of the conversation. That being said, it can't just be a freewheeling organic conversation because time is limited always, even though it's important to take as much time as one needs to really cover all these topics. Um, by opening it up completely, 
you're actually potentially introducing the opportunity for power dynamics to play out. One actor could take up tons of that time. And so you do have to manipulate, sorry, not manipulate, but you do have to step in and moderate slash facilitate slash new word that has a better fitting definition that I'll think of at some point um, in order to direct the conversation to the predetermined fracture lines that were covered in the initial scoping process. And the reason I say that it's a little bit, you know, getting into a little bit of the hard process, like it's important that we at TFD identify all the issues that will be talked about. And then we clearly communicate to every stakeholder who everybody is, right? And the way we introduce stakeholders, the way we communicate with them is all very intentional. What the venue will be, how the venue is set up is very intentional. Um, I don't know too much about the psychology of that, but you know, having a circular room is much different than having a square room, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't really talk about that uh, too much internally, but it's something that you do have to think about a lot when designing the space. And then how much time is there for everybody to talk about what needs to be talked about in that space. Um, and so we do have to kind of, we try not to manipulate because we're not thinking about outcomes. We're not thinking about pleasing anybody really. We're thinking about how can everybody feel comfortable to comfortable enough to really talk about their issues face to face. And so going back to the over prioritizing governments, we do not target governments as a stakeholder often. Um, that's not to say that they're not a very important stakeholder. They will always inevitably be a part of the decision-making process once the issue gets elevated, right? Um, almost inevitably, the government makes the decisions in the end, right? Um, but we really, we don't often have government representatives in these dialogues. And you can imagine when you have, um, you know, members of a local community that's living in the forest, communicating with members from a billion dollar forestry company with the local regional representative of the government in the room. You can imagine instantly how that conversation probably won't be the same if that government representative is, is not there. Um, so I guess that is a form of manipulation, perhaps. And so we do manipulate the space in order to create an environment to try our best. And I do not do this uh, every day in my work because I'm, I'm still in the process of learning from my um, colleagues, but to try our best to um, create that space where, to use that word again, legitimate conversation can happen. And I'm not uh, equipped to define what that legitimate conversation would look like, but I'm learning how facilitation slash moderation slash that new perfect word that we haven't really identified yet um, can create the space for open dialogue. And the idea, I think we'll get to outcomes a little bit later, what, what the outcomes are, but the idea with the forest dialogue is that people come to some sort of uh, ideally consensus on the way to move forward. But going back to Taya, bringing up very briefly the word coercion, uh, which is a word that I find fascinating or a process I find fascinating. We don't, we don't start off saying, hey, we're going to agree on something and say we don't know what it is because already starting by saying we're all going to agree, that's already a bit of coercion. You don't have to agree. Ideally, we do get to some point that everybody can agree on, right? And sometimes that means it gets less specific. If we really want to solve a specific problem, but... Um, people aren't able to agree on it. Maybe we kind of elevate it a little bit more general and say, well, what about, you know, somebody might bring up um, a slightly more general approach or general solution. And eventually, you know, often everybody says, yeah, that's obviously the way forward or, or something that we should focus on. Um, but we can't say that there's going to be a document that everybody signs, a letter or a treaty or something like that, because just coming, starting the process off with the idea that we're all going to agree on something and, especially sign off on something that already is a bit coercive, I feel. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to repeat myself or kind of the conversation too much, but really the process is super important and how facilitation happens in a way that's not coercive or not manipulative is something that I think is a learning process for me personally, but also for the forest dialogue. 
Um, so the power neutral space uh, that Alina asked about or how we, we go about creating that is an evolving process. And I think it's something that we probably don't have a ton of time to talk about in depth right now, but I encourage everybody to reach out to me or other people at the Forest Dialogue, um, especially as part of a, uh, the TFD subcommission at TFD. Um, we're always open to talk about it because it is unique to each particular situation, each problem, each geography, uh, each country. So it's a, it's a conversation. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to brush over the role of youth uh, altogether, although we are uh, getting short on time, uh, but because, well, the role of youth in these processes is very important to me personally, as well as uh, as an IFSA representative, of course. Um, so I'm going to ask two questions, uh, and you can choose whichever you think is more relevant to you and you know more about uh, or you feel more about the answer. Um, the questions being, what would you say is the role of youth in local and global scale governance, or how can uh, international youth organizations such as IFSA interact in these spaces so that we can have an impact? Uh, so shortly, if maybe Peter, you may start. Okay. Um, yeah, just uh, I'll try to do it quickly because we're running out of time, as you said. Okay, at FEO, we have specific uh, focal points for youth. Uh, we also have specific projects running now with youth, not yet in, in the forestry uh, sector, uh, but on the side of forestry, maybe I can mention we have somebody at, at headquarters who is specifically uh, a focal point with ISA, that's Elaine uh, Spring I think that uh, Elaine is in contact with her. So there we try to establish. Uh, to get a better idea what the opinion is of IFSA on how we should work with youth in forestry. The other issue is that uh, we have a committee on, on forestry. Let's say that's the global platform where each two years the heads of forestry meet from all around the world to give their recommendations to FEO. And over the last, I think, three or four sessions, uh, IFSA always has been invited as one of the observers to that event. The same with the regional forestry conference. We have a regional forestry conference here in uh, Latin America. Uh, COFLAC, as we call it in, uh, in, in Spanish, the Commission for Estal para América Latina y el Caribe, where also uh, IFSA each uh, time is invited to, to participate and during a short session, all sort of observers can make their questions there. And finally, uh, also at the last World Forestry Congress was a pre-Congress uh, youth event uh, which was organized by IFSA. Elaine was very much involved in that one and uh, also during the World Forestry Conference there was a specific event on youth. So we're trying to promote it but definitely we should do more but well, you know everybody has limited time and resources but it's, it will also be up to IFSA to push for it, to push for more uh, uh, moments of where this can take place. Thank you, we're trying. <laughs> Uh, Taya? Um, I really like the, the question, well, to begin, um, I think IFSA has a role now, but also because it is such a specific group, like, you know, youth, it means it'll also have a role in the future. So one thing is what IFSA can focus on now, which is um, like how to, for example, challenge that status quo and demand a real seat at the table. Uh, because yes, like again, tokenism, like we were talking about, um, many organizations, and I think, well, maybe FAO is one of the ones that actually like does feel like, does try to involve youth in a good way, but many others, um, they give you the seat that is just like, you know, a way to maybe try to tick a box, but not really have like any meaningful engagement beyond just like maybe sitting on a stage, right? Um, so it's like really demanding and like asking those uncomfortable questions or like making those uncomfortable statements um, to actually make that a real meaningful thing. Like how can we influence a policy? Why don't, don't we get a seat at these spaces, you know? Like, so 
keep pushing towards that. And again, like it's the uncomfortable questions that actually tend to challenge the, the business as usual, even within conservation. Um, and the next one is, well, youth has a really specific role in, in the future um, because it's being able to be critical and think outside that box and question those processes. Um, and this is where I'll get back to, to Selena's question, you know, like whose voices are we not listening to? Um, and just keeping that question in mind, you know, like for example, okay, let's check, you know, what does the gender bias here look like? Uh, what does the age gap here look like? You know, um, are we maybe speaking on behalf of a stakeholder group that didn't identify us as like, you know, a legitimate, again, the word, a representative for what their views are. Like I've, I've worked with a lot of indigenous people who like they are very, very heterogeneous and they have like a federal representative and then they have uh, the federal people are represented at a subnational level and then there's a national level and like some people think like, you know, this person at the national level does not represent me. You know, like, so sometimes we think, okay, yes, there is somebody from this group, but like, do the people it is supposed to represent consider that to be, you know, good and effective representation? Um, so it's about being critical about these things and just making sure that like whenever or wherever you end up in the future, that these, these sensitivities, I would say mostly, um, are, are, are in check. Um, like Nick was saying, for example, with facilitation, it's a bit of like reading the room. Who are the people who are doing most of the talking? Like, are the people who are maybe not talking enough, um, if, if you put them on the spot and make them talk, are you actually doing them a favor? Or is it better like, you know, maybe to have a separate meeting with them um, and they can express themselves in a safe space. Uh, do I have an agenda while facilitating or do I really need like an impartial facilitator? And this is not just like for meetings, this is like facilitating or like slash that new word that is still yet to be created um, uh, in life in general. So yeah, plenty of, of stuff to think about then. Uh, but it's exciting to think, you know, like that we can start being critical now and that this is going to be reflected in the future. Thank you. Um, at this point, I'm actually gonna jump to the pop, uh, audience question because it ties into this youth involvement as well. And first, the uh, question is actually for our audience here uh, of how many have you had a course or lecture that included a role play with playing different stakeholders and trying to find a common ground so you got a kind of an experience in this governance or por policy process as well. We have a few who have some kind of experience there. Um, but then to our speakers, uh, how do you um, think we can gain experience in the processes? Like, would it be this kind of... Uh, this kind of lecture or role play, or is this the inclusion in uh, the processes that we were talking about earlier? Um, or what, what do you find that? May I jump in there? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think IFSA, representatives of IFSA, and also your peers and colleagues have opportunities through the forest dialogue to participate in our dialogues. So for example, we have a dialogue on climate positive forest products, essentially focusing on mass timber technology that's taking place next month in Helsinki. And uh, I hope that you know a lot of the European uh, students focusing on uh, building technology or forestry um, you know, can be present to participate in that dialogue. Um, and I think participating could mean very active participation or passively joining and understanding how the, the dialogue process unfolds. You know, you could um, just kind of watch and observe and obviously participate. Um, also, the Forest Dialogue runs with a steering committee of 25 uh, forestry professionals from around the world. We, they try to represent kind of as diverse of perspectives as possible. And so the youth is a critical perspective, especially when you're talking about climate change, right? And we, we know that uh, at these high level fora like the UN, um, but even at the Forest Dialogues, there is an opportunity for a forestry student to uh, be a member of the steering committee 
which ultimately decides what initiatives we pursue, where we apply the process. So um, there's actually some very concrete ways to participate with TFD. Thank you. And maybe very shortly also, Salina, you already talked about uh, the, your, in, your experience as youth and um, how, how the inclusion is, but maybe very shortly if you have anything more to add before we finish. Um, sure, yeah, I'll keep it um, short. I, just, the, I guess one thing to remember is you're building your leadership through these experiences um, that you're having. In each, each you know, encounter, dialogue, et cetera, you're learning a little bit more about, you know, what do I think made this dialogue work, what didn't? Um, IFSA is the best space for you to learn and cultivate your own you know, style of leadership, understand your values and what makes sense to you. And I would say, you know, um, you would be surprised, but other international organizations are not as organized or strategic or coordinated or logical as you would imagine from the outside. Um, so don't discount yourself, both as an individual and as an organization as IFSA. Um, never buy into the lie that because you have less experience that you should have less responsibility. Um, you know, I've seen project proposals written at the last minute on very tenuous assumptions. It happens very often. So I think don't, um, you know, we should all remember the, the, the role that IFSA has as a non-political, you know, organization that I think really can truly serve as an implementing partner in achieving substantive, you know, progress on issues of forced education or restoration or governance, whatever the case may be. Um, so this is, you know, your professional experience has already started by you engaging in these, this space um, to take advantage of it. Um, and, and yeah, continue to explore, to build that together. Um, yeah, I think that this is the, the most freeing, exciting space you can do it in because you kind of get to reinvent and think beyond what, what exists and, and not you know copy and, and, and build upon what, um, what hasn't been working for years. So that's just my general piece of advice because I think a lot of my own uh, values were cultivated and my own understanding of my leadership was cultivated in IFSA. Um, and it's, it, you know, continues to guide me because I, I had the freedom to be able to um, explore that in this space. Yeah, that's it. Thank Maybe you. Maybe a small comment? Yeah. Very brief. I mean, having worked also on first education during many years and you still being first students, I still it's also very important to look within your curricula, what kind of free space you have. And I'm thinking about two issues which I think are extremely important. One has to do a bit with the soft skills. I think uh, if you have opportunities to follow courses on negotiation skills, for instance, because at the end that's what I, what's it about, how to negotiate between the different groups. And another very important issue, and I think it's completely overlooked, I think, and it might not be in your direct interest as, as a forestry student, but at the end it's all about money. And what is the finding at this moment a lot of activities or most activities taking place are all those different, uh, different financing mechanisms. A good knowledge of all those financing mechanisms, things like how green climate funds work, how uh, the global environment funds work, all those kind of issues, that definitely will give you a pre if you're looking for work later on. And at the end, that's also how you can support the work of all those different stakeholders and their activities. Just a small can I also chip in? <laughs> yeah. I'll be very brief, I promise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think like the key word I'd like to take away from that is also exposure. And like what Selena was saying, like these are the spaces where we can learn. I mean, we, we begin our lives by, by not knowing anything. So we gradually learn and it's okay to not know. Um, and we are born in certain specific contexts which are not like other contexts. So like, you know, it's precisely these kind of spaces where we can have like those interactions and learn about those things that we do not have experience on to like broaden our mind. So I think that's a key word, just trying to get exposure from like maybe what we don't know enough about and to just open our minds and continue learning. Yeah, thank you. I think these are very hopeful messages of how we actually uh, can come together as, as youth and raise our voices and we don't have to be just observers. Um, for final remarks, uh, you've talked about different points of views uh, and I don't know, I think I want to do the same that Florent did uh, in our in the panel in the opening ceremony. If you can in one sentence uh, come to uh, what is the key message you want to convey? Um, 
and maybe Salina can start. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think it would be to experiment, to um, listen and observe kind of closely. There's a lot you can learn from, from observation. Um, and then, I've lost my third point already. Uh, I think the last one would be to trust your intuition, um, yeah. Thank you. That's, I think that's very good. And I think that's something everyone can do even with no prior experience. Um, Nick? Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. I think um, decision making and governance needs to be participatory. Uh, it needs to be process driven and include as many diverse uh, viewpoints and perspectives as possible. Um, and I think to I think to steal a little bit of what Taya said on a panel the other day that we really need to listen really openly and honestly. And I think that's something that we can all do. It's kind of a responsibility to be as open to diverse perspectives as possible. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. I was just saying, thank you, Nick. Um, I think, sorry, did you just give me the word? Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, power dynamics. Um, so I think my key takeaway, uh, I keep thinking of the word humility. Um, so asking ourselves the question, and this is maybe like a way to tackle power and all of these things, like, you know, effective for who? Uh, because equity and effectiveness in the end go hand in hand. So I think my takeaway message is more of a question. Um, yeah. Nice. Peter, go ahead. Uh, I want to be very brief this time. I think you should not only, no, you should not think you're really the expert because you know so much about forestry on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, don't tr trust a lot more than now on your non forestry skills. Perfect. With that, I want to uh, thank you for attending. Um, I was hoping I would have my own closing remark as well, but I think I said that just before I gave you the um, floor for the last time, saying that uh, there is hope there in the youth participation, and we need to work for that, but, um, but we are going to reach something better, we think. Uh, so thank you for attending, all of our speakers. Thank you for attending uh, all of our audience. Uh, I've been very glad to be here today with all of you. Thank you, Alina, for everything. Thank you to the speakers. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, it was a great opportunity to reflect on how we can all work together. How can international organizations do something about the changes we need to make? So thank you again. And a final round of applause for the conversatory, please. So now, if we want to keep talking about this, to meditate the reflections we can um, get out of the conversatory, I invite you to, the, to a coffee break um, in the cafeteria that we uh, went the other day on Thursday. And we can be here at um, 11 and 10. So, Go, please.
and different actors in the forestry sector, but here in a local uh, scale in Chile. So for that matter, I would like to introduce you to Monica Gavai, a professor from the University of Chile. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Great. Well, my name is uh, Claudia Cerda. I am a researcher at the University of Chile. I work on social dimensions of forests and nature conservation. And for me, it's, uh, really, um, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I thank uh, the organizers for this invitation. Um, and because I think this is a very important session for uh, the sustainability of forests. Um, sustainability of forests depends on good governance models, no? Um, and I think uh, this is a very important reason to discuss how we are understanding the concept of governance. What are we talking uh, when we discuss about governance? Because maybe we understand different things, no? And um, research, current research, indicates that governance um, are really important for sustainability in the future. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. And in this session, I'd like to present uh, my colleagues here. They uh, have a great experience in different sides of the problem. We have uh, here today and welcome Christian Little. Christian is the director of the National Forest Corporation in our country. Welcome, Christian. Um, we, uh, uh, Charles Kimber is also here. Charles, thanks a lot to be here today. He uh, works in, uh, in the corporate people and sustainability manager of Arauco company. And uh, we thank also Florencia Mesa. Hi, Florencia. Thanks to be here today. Um, uh, of the general manager, she's a general manager of Balum Latam. No? So this session has three parts. First, uh, our um, colleagues here will present. Uh, I'm, also, I'm going to present also um, different perspectives about uh, their work related to forest governance. Then we um, respond some interesting questions about their work related to governance. And then um, they will have the opportunity to confront themselves with, with questions also. And we finish with uh, questions from you. Okay? So, um, welcome and thanks to be here in this session today. So, I think we start with Charles.
do enjoy your trip whilst here. My name is Charlie Kimber. Um, I came to business school here at Universidad Católica some 40 years ago. Uh, I finished in 1985, and since then I've, I joined a company called Arauco, so I've been working at this company now for just over 37 years. And um, I, I wanted to share this video with you about what's happening in, in Chile from a forestry point of view. The journey has been uh, fantastic. In, in 40 years, we have uh, grown tremendously. We're one of the leading countries worldwide in forest, forest practices, in industry, and in commerce. Uh, Chile has uh, been a small country. We were a very poor country 40 years ago. We've managed to uh, sort out many of the issues uh, around poverty, around life expectancy, and improving the income and welfare of families in Chile. So we're very proud of what different sectors have done, and, and forestry has played a key role. When I joined the company, uh, we were a very small or well, medium-sized company. We used to sell about $180 million a year with, with just two pulp mills here in Chile. And now we've grown to a company with more than $7 billion in sales. We have uh, operations in 11 countries, uh, 64 industrial facilities. We are large uh, forest owners. We plant about 100 million trees a year. Uh, we, not only do we plant uh, pine and eucalyptus, we also plant and reestablish native forest. Uh, we have uh, grown to over 5,000 customers around the world. We are one of the largest and most important uh, uh, manufacturers and providers of pulp, panel products, plywood, MDF, particle board, lumber, and anything to do with remanufactured products. We are just concluding the construction now of a CLT mill. And um, we employ about 18,500 people worldwide. Uh, we work with another 15,000 uh, people that are contractors for our operations. So it operates at a, at a large scale. Uh, we are very important in Chile. We're very large in Chile. Uh, we sell product in Chile, but uh, about 90 95% of what we produce, manufacture, is exported. So we are an export-driven uh, organization. And um, we have facilities, uh, as I mentioned, in another 11 countries. And I think I'm through with, I have 40 seconds. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm in charge. Uh, my professional life was originally, first I started as, a, as a, just an engineer, working, traveling, learning the business uh, in Chile. Then uh, logistics, sales, marketing. Uh, I established our sales offices overseas. Um, I've sold all of the products that we manufacture. And for the last uh, 15, 17 years, I've been responsible for uh, sustainability, corporate affairs, communications and also people. So 18,500 people have an organization that works under me in order to manage uh, all the benefits, compensation, salaries, make sure that everybody gets paid, that they have their benefits, and, and that we have good standards. And I also work a lot of, uh, along the lines of sustainability, and I'm ready to take any question that you may have or the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charles, for your interesting presentation. I think it's Christian's turn now. I, or it doesn't matter. Yo, sorry. I don't know if maybe I used that for change. The maybe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. My name is Florencia. Oh, okay. And I'm re re representing Balloon. Balloon is not an NGO, it's a social enterprise. I don't know if you know what is a social enterprise is, but we, we try to achieve social, economic, and environmental uh, goals. And we work with um, entrepreneurs, communities, and in rural territories. And we try to to install in them uh, entrepreneurship and innovation skills. And also we try to generate um, uh, a common uh, territorial vision about development. And maybe you know that, but Chile is a country full of wealth and opportunity, but also it's a very unequal country and mostly in rural areas. Uh, for example, if you, all the numbers, you, you can find uh, in the rural areas is maybe the double or triple more than in urban areas. So uh, with Balloon, we want to, 
to try to, to solve those problems. And also in Chile, uh, we have 83% uh, of our territory is rural, but only lives the 4.5 million of people there. So in some cases, the public politics are not uh, in interesting in those people because there are less votes. So how uh, we do our work? We work with entrepreneurs, community, and with territory. But in the beginning of, uh, of our, our uh, company, also work with only entrepreneurs, but then we start to work with community and territory because it's very important to, to, the, um, to the vision uh, for co in common. So this is our community. Uh, we work in the south of Chile, and a lot of them belongs uh, to indigenous people and all, all other things uh, that people th doesn't know that when we talk about local entrepreneurs or communities, a lot of people think only in indigenous people or only in small entrepreneurs, but we work with this diversity, small, medium, big entrepreneurs, triple impact entrepreneurs, cooperatives, and also territorial leaders who are very important to governance. And also, other thing that I want to uh, discuss with you is the relation between nature and people. Um, it's not all. It, it's not in other. In all the cases, are harmonious. For example, this is a quote of a territorial leader, who, when we talk with them about a conservation project, he he think in distrust distraught, fear, danger, and sus suspicious. And if, if, if you uh, see those words, uh, not in, in all cases, a conservation project for the, com for the communities is, uh, is a good thing. So we, we need to also think in, in, in those things and also involve them with participation. It's fundamental for them. Other thing, uh, that I want to discuss with you is what is a community. In in local uh, territories, uh, the um, the community uh, are all these actors. But I, I want to show you two things. Um, in the different region of Chile, uh, we need to be aware the the different particularity that the territory has, and also the trust and the relation of of uh, uh, the level of social capital that uh, we have between, between them. And also, we need to understand the level of this relationship. If we want to be a good governance or development, we need to understand how they are related. And this is an example. Uh, this is um, um, uh, some tools that we uh, use for uh, for work with the communities, and if you look them, the governance, the the people and nature are things that we are very uh, that we study to make a community development. Also, here, for example, this is the Patagonia network map, and in, in this case, we um, uh, uh, related the, the the people and institutions, and then we work with them to and make uh, a better governance. And this is uh, uh, the final thing. This is the balloon community journey. And this is the steps that we use to, to, to creation of local uh, government space. And then uh, maybe we can discuss about them uh, because uh, uh, I, I have uh, two little more minutes because the people here ask me that how um, territorial leaders uh, about uh, uh, think about uh, this uh, big question. And here I have a little bit of quotes that uh, they sent me to, to share with you. And for example, uh, this is a, a, a territorial quote who, I'm, I'm a Puche leader who sent me the, uh, the way that we related with uh, companies are in the good neighbor format, and we need to move to good neighbor to good living. I don't know if you know, but in Mapuche culture, they use a lot of this, this uh, 
this thing uh, is kumemogen, is good living for them. Also, uh, here, um, uh, this territorial leader uh, and, uh, uh, talk about the, um, the cultural space, uh, the space cultural sig significant for them. They said that maybe the forest company uh, leave some parts of the forest for them. I I try, I ask Charles uh, then if they do that. I think they do, but not in all the cases. In 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 this uh, quote, um, the territorial leader says that uh, CONAF is still a transactional relationship with them, and they are not uh, well trained to community relationship and. Uh, also, they give me a, a good example uh, in Mapulawal in, in Osorno, and they are very happy with, with this kind of, of relationship. And the, the last one, um, also, uh, they is, is say to me that the forest for them is not only a productive um, um, uh, thing, it also have an important spiritual relationship, and they say to and did and he said to me that we need to think in that for this the first step to move forward to uh, has a good governance. That's the final one. Thanks, uh, Florencia, for presenting us the interesting work uh, you do. I think it's my turn, or Christian, my turn. Okay. Thanks. Well, um, okay, so my presentation uh, is about what we understand when we discuss about governance. So it refers to the concept of governance. Um, in this part, you can see some um, illustration uh, of a vegetation in Northern Chile, in Atacama Desert. Uh, this was prepared for um, one of my students. And uh, you also have um, the damage of beaver, which is an alien, alien species in Southern Chile, in our country. Well, we know that um, governance is key for sustainable forests, right? So uh, it's important to recognize that governance is more than norms, rules, laws, and policies. Most of the time we are um, discussing about laws as the solution to our problems or our conflicts in forests. But governance is more than that, no? So it refers to public and private interactions destined to solve common problems. Structures, it refers also to structures, processes and interactions through which multiple actors distribute the power. So governance is a question of power related to forests and how that power generates conflicts or not. So establishing governance models means, for example, political definitions about how the power is distributed among different actors, to understand how the access to ecosystem services, for example, occur, and uh, from this point of view, uh, to talk or to discuss about ecosystem services is very important because, at least in our country, most of the discussion and most of the forest management refers to how we use, value, or enjoy ecosystem services provided by forests. So, um, and, and that's very complex because uh, it is not about forest on one hand side or people on the other hand, uh, or which is more important than the other, but is the relationship between both of them, uh, what should be sustainable for 
a sustainable future. So uh, some factors that condition robust or weak forest governance systems, um, I tried to, to show some of them here. For example, it's very uh, relevant to understand ecological and social dimensions of forest degradation and loss. And that's a very interdisciplinary question. We also need to understand uh, the institutional functioning and how it affects our forest today. We also need to understand patterns of social behavior at individual and collective levels. We have to include local ecological knowledge because this knowledge uh, may explain many of the attitudes or behaviors toward forest uh, in local communities. And this has been built in a very complex way through the time. Uh, we also need to um, strengthen uh, legislation and norms. And also we have to discuss, of course, about incentives and markets. Research indicates some key aspects for good forest governance. For example, um, good forest models uh, are transparent and uh, it has low levels of corruption. Uh, participation of different parts is very important. Um, we have to discuss about or we have to, to research or to explore how is the access in terms, of, in terms of justice to different ecosystem services of forests. Uh, we need, of course, consistent laws. And uh, we have to recognize also that forests don't operate isolated from other sectors. And of course, these things require uh, interdisciplinary approaches. And most of the time, we, we have to recognize that we don't have all the information and we have to work with, between different, um, or among different disciplines to solve that problems. Um, and uh, I have here some uh, interesting papers that maybe you can review after. Uh, and it seems to be that sustainability science or sustainability disciplines uh, try now to solve complex questions because governance is a complex question. So uh, we have to prepare uh, ourselves, our capacities to create um, a dialogue uh, between different disciplines. So it, that's my presentation. Thanks a lot. Christian, it's your turn now. My turn. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to introduce you, Gerber. You will be my English support to chair, <clears throat> to chair some idea, idea uh, with you and Gerber. Uh, I'm a forest. I'm really happy to, to be here to share some idea to forests and governance. Uh, probably the, the main concept uh, for our discussions in, in policy uh, now in Chile. Uh, I'm forest engineers uh, for a lot of years. I'm a PhD for forest hydrology. I'm a um, my master student in, in, in forest science or in other forest disciplines uh, uh, related to ecosystem services. Um, how do you say um, that the governance and forest represent the main issue for you, for for your professions, um, all of your you are um, forest engineers, but we need uh, to expand uh, our mind to share with other disciplines 
like anthropologists, socialists, and other uh, disciplines to, to because uh, the, the stress in policy, in international policy, in national policy, policy related to uh, how the people uh, to uh, how it relates with the environment. Yeah, and my uh, my main uh, message for you is: uh, I'm forest engineers. My specialist is forest hydrology, silvicultural systems, and all of idea related to forest engineers is associated to the physical issues. But ecosystem services and other uh, natural rights, for instance, is not physical issues. And not physical issues is related to human dimensions. And for uh, probably in the same idea with you, I'm now a national director of forest sectors in Chile, in very special moment related to our constitutions uh, to give some uh, rights for uh, natural rights, you know? And uh, I'd like to share some idea uh, related to forest uh, for our institutions or in Spanish, bosque and bosque in, in our uh, uh, law is a physical issue, you know? And um, yeah, this is my presentation for you. I'm forest engineers, you are the future, you are my colleagues now, and we are talking about forest engineers, how the forest engineers uh, uh, can give some solutions for uh, our uh, ecosystems management, you know? Because Forest uh, research for forest students is a crisis now in our country. You know, our country, uh, uh, the forest engineers is a uh, uh, change for uh, forest, not forest, this is natural uh, management. Yeah? Okay, it's enough. Thanks, Christian, for um, your presentation. I think we go now to the second part of this session, right? Um, and we, we will talk about um, the governance understanding uh, from your perspective. So we have to solve a question, um, and we have to talk about what we, what is governance for for example, the Forest National Corporation, what is governance for Arauco, uh, what, or, or for your work, Florencia, and uh, also from um, what is governance for, for scholars, right? So I don't know who, who wants to, to start. Okay, Charles, thanks. Hello, hello, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, Claudia, you gave a very good uh, framework there with, with with governance, huh? uh, with definitions around governance. Let me, sorry, how, how much time do we have for this? Is it about, six? yeah? Okay, we have, we have a little bit of time. It's not one minute, yeah? okay. Um, so, so governance for, for a, a, a company, for, for industry, for a sector is of course the, the framework in which we must uh, develop ourselves. Uh, within that framework, uh, I would say that we have certain standards, systems, a way that we organize ourselves. But, but there's also, governance is a, a moral compass. Um, it's uh, doing the right thing. And uh, it's also organizing yourself to uh, uh, interact with uh, other, let's call them institutions, organizations that in theory are not part of what would one would have understand that that was governance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that society, particularly in the last 20 years, has uh, 
question the way that we understand the role of business. They have questioned the way that business is carried out, that business is done. And, and so one has to have the, 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 the leadership and, and, and the, the internal thrust, the internal force in organizations, not only to carry out your business in a, in a successful way, which is already a big challenge because many businesses go out of business because they are badly run, but you also have to expand your business into other fields of what perhaps when I went to business school at least, I never got taught. So uh, you need to have the ability to connect with society. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a few examples. And following Florencia's presentation, uh, I think that all of the statements that I read there are accurate. And so one of the challenges that we have as forestry companies is how do we change our practices? How do we anticipate uh, those changes? And of course, in many, many areas, we're running behind. Uh? Even if we're running, sometimes we're walking or we, we may even be walking backwards. Mm? So the importance of governance is that it helps you also to have that moral compass uh, to uh, direct your efforts in areas where perhaps you thought that you were not hired for. Mm? Um, I'm talking from the business point of view, so excuse me that I use all these uh, business uh, terms, but I think it is important that, that, that those business, say, my background is, is around engineering, chemistry, uh, commerce, marketing, etc., all sort of the hard disciplines. So, as Christian said, how do we talk with anthropology? I remember 25 years ago, we hired the first psychologist in, in our company, and, and one of the senior managers said, why do we hire psychologists? Well, I guess that today, as a company, we probably have 50, 70 people that study psychology. We have people that study anthropology. And so it's opening up. Governance also requires um, permeability. Huh? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a two-way road. It's ad adaptation. It's flexibility. It's not only abiding to the rules and doing your business uh, correctly. And I, and I have several examples where we have managed to incorporate new governance to our organization in order to tackle some very complex situations, as well as new governance in order to take advantage of business opportunities. And it's not, uh, which would not have been, we would not, not have been able to take advantage if we would have addressed them with a traditional type of organization that, that we had. But I think I'm, well, I have one minute still. Huh? Should I carry on? So let, let me give you a, a few examples. Um, perhaps with Christian later, we can talk a little bit about governance um, in the fire season. Fire season in Chile starts fairly soon, around early October, ends, we always like it to end in, in March, but most probably it's April, May. Uh, so we have six, seven months of very dry season, and we have lots of forest fires. So we have a governance together with CONAF and the private sector in order to prevent fires, uh, detect fires, and then combat fires. Mm -hmm. So that is a specific uh, structure. It's well organized. People know the role they have to pay, play. Um, Governance is also uh, what we did in the early 80s, mid 80s, and the way that we organized ourselves. We were a small, faraway country. So how did we go and, let's say, conquer the world with our products? We first had to go and sell our country, sell the, the positive aspects of Chile being a, a stable country. We were just, uh, we, we were under dictatorship in those days. So, th so there was a tremendous effort to go and sell our country then sell our sector and that we were going to be a reliable manufacturer and supplier of forest products and then sell our company and our own products because of course competition, I wanted to be ahead of my competitors. So, so that required of a specific governance of how we, we managed to do that. And then governance in, in dealing with, um, uh, with crisis, with complex situation, with uh, environmental questioning, and working with uh, universities, with academia, with the science, with science, with civil society, 
uh, with the public sector, with other uh, private companies, in order to address complex problems and find solutions to these complex uh, problems. And um, we can probably run out of time, but uh, we can also talk about uh, Mapuche-related issues and the sort of governance and the lack of governance that unfortunately exists many times there. Thanks a lot, Charles, for your discussion. So that's very interesting. Uh, we can identify a lot of questions um, uh, from your, your, your explanation, your talk. So I, I don't know, maybe Cristiano or Florencia? Yeah, of course. Uh, <coughs> governance. Is Renata, <clears throat> she's an anthropologist, Renata Barcelino, and probably now, now she's a specialist of governance and forest sector in Chile. She's in charge of uh, to define governance uh, for our sector uh, in, in now, in this moment, because uh, it's a, a new concept for, for our institutions. Uh, not for us, uh, not because, but uh, governance is a new concept. Uh, she is a specialist, and she can uh, give you uh, 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 ideas. Okay, um, in, in Spanish is better for me for to share some idea. Uh, primero, uh, que gobernanza es un concepto. Firstly, governance is a concept. Y bosque es un concepto. And as well, forest is a concept. Um, it's, it's like a concept. It's, uh, they are uh, both concepts. Yeah. Uh, um, gobernanza tiene eh, que ver con gobierno, con toma de decisiones. So governance has to do with government, with the taking of decisions. Probablemente una definición puede ser fácil. Um, a definition could be easy. Pero lo complicado es la implementación. Um, but the difficult part here is the implementation. Gobernanza aparece como concepto Governance appears as a concept. Cuando hay algún aspecto de la política que when, no resuelve. When there is an aspect of the, of the politics that doesn't resolve. Algún aspecto relacionado, en este caso, con la conservación en los territorios. Uh, some concepts, some concepts related to the... Territorios. With the territories. Actualmente nosotros estamos trabajando para definir en the moment we are working to define lo que puede resultar eh, algo fácil what can be something easy pero la expresión en el territorio en nuestro territorio con diferentes eh, aproximaciones culturales valores sociales hacia la naturaleza pero la expresión the de, del concepto en su aplicación en los territorios um, the expression of the concept and the application in the territories se complejiza, se hace complicado is very complicated eh, en CONAF en la administración de los ecosistemas boscosos en CONAF en la administración de de los ecosistemas, de forest ecosystems. Forest ecosystems. Eh, probablemente será en los próximos años uno de los principales desafíos. Uh, will probably be one of the most uh, challenging things in the coming years. Eh, porque una de las principales razones. Because one of the principal reasons, one of the main reasons. Es que en Chile ha habido una política de facto is that in Chile uh, there was a, a de facto politics eh, probablemente ligada al capitalismo uh, which you could call capitalism que define bosques como un elemento físico 
and which is defining forests, the term forest, as a physical element, a physical thing. Al definir en la norma como algo físico, while uh, by defining forests as something physical, las instituciones como la que yo represento, the institutions like the one he, I am representing, manejan y se aproximan al bosque como algo físico. Uh, manage a forest as something physical. Pero la expresión social y las demandas sociales por el bosque but the social um, expression and demands of the forest demandan lo no físico, los servicios ecosistémicos. What we need is to look at the forest as something non-physical. Y si no existe norma para la regular lo no físico, if there is no norm to, to regulate the non-physical, entonces la gobernanza resuelve como concepto el problema de los bienes comunes. Uh, governance as a concept um, results in the problem of common, the common good. Yes, fácil. Easy. Thanks, Christian. I don't know, Florencia, maybe you, would you like to? Um, um, thank you, Charles and Christian, for your opinions. Um, I think, uh, well, um, our work in community, um, we um, face with the concept of governance uh, because um, uh, our approach to develop business is uh, with the social capital. So if you, if you want to good a uh, good business or a good alliance, you, you have to work in social capital. So we, we, when we start to work with communities, we discover that the, um, the, the good uh, cooperatives or the good collective are the who trust a lot each other. So the first step to to have a good governance is not try to to uh, reunite it first. So you have to work in trust first, and then the final step is the governance. A lot of people uh, start um, uh, with governance to reunite the people, but this is a consequence of. A, a good relationships, uh, a, 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 a good trust. So uh, this is a, a thing that uh, we we work a lot, and also in governance, uh, the community are not the good ones, and the state uh, or the government or the companies are the bad. This is a. Uh, this is a thing that we 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 have to um, uh, uh, don't think about that because the community uh, wants to talk and dialogue and dialogue with the state and and the companies and also and and and, and Charles told us in in Araucania, for example, the don't seek dialogue, don't dogs exist good governance. So. The, the 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 good um, uh, politics and, and ne never happened. So um, also for us, um, the governance is the space that that uh, in intelligence collective appears because you had a different perspective to resolve a problem, and you you you. You, with with all these um, experiences, the communities, the government, the majors, the uh, local organizations, you you um, can do a good roadmap, and and also if they doesn't work, all uh, all uh, can um, 
resolve that that those problems and the community don't expect that the state of, of the companies uh, resolve of the problems he they want to also participate in 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 those uh, plans or those roadmaps and finally um the charles also said that the government the governance is not static you 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 have you have to manage all the time because now the the good pace in the good space of governments you talk a lot of things not only bad things also the good things so uh, we, we need to manage and we need to all the time uh, uh, talk and uh, also has claudia told us with a lot of tr transparency because uh, the the community don't want that when we have a problem we disappear we, when we have a problem we, we stay there and put our face and put our our name and with them resolve the problem in the um, in the in those space so that, that's it and it's your turn claudia thanks florencia well um I, I can talk to you um, from a, an academic point of view. Uh, I think um, I have not a, a challenge uh, through the years to deal with complexity. I think for scholars, the main challenge today to discuss or to research uh, things related to governance uh, is to deal with complexity because we are not always prepared to that. Uh, for example, when I was a student um, in the 90s, uh, we, we didn't discuss in class uh, about governance or about social issues of forests. And um, from forest engineers, uh, for example, this learning is, is, um, is like a, a, a personal learning. No, through the years, to this process. So uh, I, are, uh, I get to governance topics working with ecosystem services. Christian already talked about that. Uh, because ecosystem services is not just uh, about identification of economic valuation of ecosystem services. When you work with ecosystem services, you detect that uh, it's, it's a question of access to ecosystem services is also a question of justice. And then when you talk about governance, uh, it's not how local communities use the forests uh, or, they, or, or how they generate, for example, um, degradation of forests, but it's also how the institutional context is affecting to that. So, so uh, it's a very complex issue, um, and from my point of view, I, I, I don't know if you agree with me, uh, we now are learning uh, about governance. Uh, we don't have much experience from uh, an, an academic point of view discussing or publishing papers or experience about governance. For example, uh, where are the problems? in this model of governance. So I think uh, that's a very important discussion uh, from, from the academy uh, to advance in this complex uh, topic. Well, I think... <coughs> I think... Um, I like oh. to say something about uh, for restoration, probably. You know, natural forest restoration in Chile. Uh, we are now we are uh, we have an agenda for uh, uh, <clears throat> native forest restoration, uh, multiple scale and large scale, uh, because uh, restoration is a very nice concept for governance. Very nice concept because it's a triangle for private sector, governmental, and and the society. Uh, it's a uh, a negotiation for for different issues uh, related to ecosystem services, for instance, and it's a very uh, um, 
uh, easy to implement some and uh, <clears throat> uh, probably for a restoration for you uh, is uh, some indic in 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 uh, it's a few uh, it's a, a real challenge a real yeah uh, to uh, some in indicators for for restoration uh, ecosystem services like uh, forest water quality or uh, biodiversity or um, wherever you want related to ecosystem services because we're talking about ecosystem service ecosystem service but what means in the reality what means you know for uh, hydrologists is a, a runoff for 20% of change of runoff related to some percent of change of forest ecosystem, natural ecosystem. But in, in biodiversity, what means for you? It's my question for you. For You are the student. You are the future. You need to put idea uh, for ecosystem services. You need to put idea for biodiversity because uh, the not physical issue, but in the reality, in your in your brain, need to to put idea, or in in, in not physical way, you know, because uh, expression for timber, okay, is a good timber, but belleza uh, scenica, as uh, scenic beauty, scenic beauty, yeah, scenic. or runoff. How do you express in the in the territory for for Mapuche people, for the Aguita people, for other culture? This is your uh, this is your challenge. Your challenge, okay? It's a, a commitment with you. Okay. Well, I th do. You have a question or? Yes, at the, at the end of the session, uh, we have the opportunity to um, for questions. I think, yes, I think we have, uh, we can still have some time to discuss, uh, to, to make questions uh, here. So, Charles, I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree with Christian about the importance of, of generating ideas and, and for a group like yourselves to... Um, to explore uh, in, in depth uh, biodiversity, ecosystem challenges, uh, social issues. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just be provocative because I come, I'm representing the business sector. Success is not about ideas, it's about execution. Mm -hmm. so, so not only do generate good ideas, uh, be capable of executing those good ideas. And that's where again, governance is key in order to be able to execute uh, good ideas. Thanks, Charles. I don't know if you have some questions or would you like to, to discuss other topic, other ideas, give a message to our audience? I, I have a question for Christian. Okay, so okay. Charles have a quest, yeah. has a question for Christian. Christian okay. Why don't we share with, with the audience a little bit about Chile's uh, compromise with uh, climate change hmm? and how from the forest sector hmm, uh, we, we are making a contribution. Uh, Chile, Chile, so that you know about, and Christian will have the, the numbers more exact than me, but I think 57% 50, of uh, uh, carbon emission reduction is, is captured by the forest that we have in Chile. And, uh, and there is a compromise of Chile to, for 2030 to go forward and expand through, particularly through uh, restoration, native forest restoration, uh, expand our, our number of hectares. So perhaps, Christian, you can share yeah. a little bit with them. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's a very good question, Charles, for our uh, country. We, we have a, a compromise, compromise uh, uh, international compromise to uh, carbono neutralidad for the uh, próximos 30 años. And 
Sí, sorry. Sorry, but my English is not real. Eh, ten, tenemos compromisos de, de hacia la carbono neutralidad. So for the coming 25 years we have made some uh, some compromises, some hacia, commitments. Sí, hacia el, hacia el año 2050 ser un país carbono neutral y para eso necesitamos incorporar eh, al, a la actividad forestal. So in the year 2050 we want to be a carbon neutral country and to do that we need to uh, use our forestry eh, a la actividad forestal a través de la forestación, restauración, del, de las tasas de forestación con especies exóticas, ¿no? con especies nativas, con, con lo que sea en el sector forestal. So we have to work on reforestation, on uh, replanting native species, things like that. Eh, tenemos un tema mm, que tiene que ver con gobernanza en, en los territorios. We have a topic that's related to governance in the territories. Con política forestal. With forestry politics. Para que el Estado genere los instrumentos de política apropiados para eh, activar o reactivar nuestro sector. So that the government uh, implements the political factors to reinitiate the, the sector, the forestry sector. Eh, por cierto que estamos lejos todavía de esas tasas de de restauración o de reforestación o deforestación. Of Fora. course, of course, we're still far from from the goals we have regarding reforestation. Eh, porque no hemos logrado eh, en el Congreso tener acuerdos importantes en materia de qué especies y cómo vamos a focalizar los instrumentos de política. Because in the Congress we still have not uh, agreed uh, upon very important things like. Um, How are we going to, to reach this? Por ejemplo, tenemos una ley de cambio climático. For example, we have a law that's related to climate change. Que en uno de los artículos eh, señala que el Estado no incentivará las plantaciones de rápido crecimiento. And in one of the one of the um, in in the law, it's actually stated that the, the state incentivizes uh, fast growing plantations. That it doesn't do so. Eh, pero en las plantaciones de rápido crecimiento también representan una oportunidad para pequeños productores. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it's a, it's a thing that um, fast growing plantations can prove an opportunity for uh, local foresters. Y por lo tanto tenemos que generar también políticas o instrumentos. Eh, que vayamos avanzando como la restauración a gran escala de bosque nativo. And that's why we also have to create these politics or this, uh, these instruments to, to, work, to pay attention to these things. Sí. Eh, lo, lo último, un, un mensaje, de, con esto termino, yo creo que el, el mensaje para los estudiantes de ingeniería forestal. The last thing, just a message for you as uh, forestry students. Uh, cuestionense, pregunten, ask yourself, rompan el paradigma, break the paradigm, trabajen en lo no físico, work on the non-physical, la nuestra profesión, la ingeniería forestal, Our profession, forestry engineering, puede entregar un tremendo aporte y así va a ser a la sociedad y tenemos que cambiar la tendencia para atraer nuevos estudiantes, aportar a la industria, aportar al Estado, aportar a la sociedad civil a través de la ingeniería forestal. Can be a tremendous, uh, <laughs> it can be a tremendous help for for the society and we actually have a responsibility to work on this to. Uh, work with civil society and related actors to improve the status quo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, Claudia, I have a question for my partner here, Charles. Um, Arauco is a huge company. Uh, it's a, a lot of companies of the world uh, are like want to be like Arauco. So um, 
what do you think or what you dream about your or, or, or your challenges uh, for your relationship with the communities you you have a you you told us you 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 have a lot of uh, good things but now the good things in some cases are the hygienic things so what do you dream uh, what, what are the challenges about the relationship for the communities for for and why i ask you that because if arauco moves a lot of big company moves so i don't know what you think about that thank you lorenzo um and of course i can give around this topic uh, a, a sort of a large um response but uh, but i would like to dive in into something much more specific rather than just read you my corporate so, uh, social responsibility uh, pamphlet um as i mentioned we, we're present in very many countries we have forestry in argentina uruguay brazil chile we have industrial operations south africa germany po uh, portugal spain canada us mexico Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Chile, and um, so, so we have a uh, we, we have a way of uh, engaging with community. We have a, a policy. Uh, we have leadership. I, I lead that that area. Uh, the CEO leads that area, and and I, I report to the CEO. Uh, but but specific, what would be my 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 dream, my my interest? Uh, is, is particularly dealing with uh, a situation that we have in southern Chile, uh, an area that you're probably going to visit in Araucanía. Um, it's uh, inhabited by, by Mapuche. It has been inhabited for centuries by Mapuche people. Uh, Ma Mapuche people in Chile have not been recognized. We do not understand their culture. We do not understand their language. We are not taught about Mapuche people at school. We do not discuss about Mapuche people in, um, in the elites. It's not discussed in Santiago. Santiago is the capital of Chile. This, this has been neglected for centuries. And, uh, and we have an expression now. We have, we, have a, we have a reaction. We've had it for the last 20 years from Mapuche people. And we have been deaf and uh, blind to what they've been asking. So this is, this is a very complex situation. It's very complex for our company. Uh, we feel also very responsible. We think that we can be uh, an important factor in finding solutions. There is not one solution to Mapuche-related problems. There are many problems as well. This has to be approached from a very territorial point of view. And territorial is probably 50 kilometers difference from one area to another. Uh, it requires tremendous governance, governance that we do not have. Uh, the main uh, responsible for the problems that we have has been the Chilean state for decades. This is not uh, a problem of the current government. It's a problem that has been uh, sitting there out in the other side of the fence for for since, since 1870s. So we have uh, 150 years of, of lack of attention. And, and so I think that a, a company like ours, we have uh, a, a relationship with 430 uh, Mapuche communities. We have a Mapuche policy since uh, about 20 years ago. Um, we, are, uh, we, we have conflict. We, we are, uh, we've had violent uh, situations. Um, um, just to, to give you a number, we have currently 300 people that work for our contractors or work for our company that have been under psychological stress. And so we are supporting them with psychological advice. Uh, more than 120 uh, equipment, uh, th these are trucks, uh, cranes, uh, um, cars have been attacked. Uh, and all this in an area where Mapuche families live, they are also victims. We have big problems, not only uh, from a social point of view, we have uh, 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 criminal organizations operating in the area. These are non-Mapuche criminal organizations. We have a problem with, uh, with drug dealing. We have a problem with uh, stealing of wood, industrial scale stealing of wood. Uh, 30,000 trucks 
a year. So, um, so there, as, I, as, I, as I go through the list, there are many challenges and our, our organization is prepared to engage, is prepared to uh, work along the lines of dialogue. We are prepared to also transfer land. Uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, people dedicated to this, 100% uh, of their time, 24-7. And so working together with civil society, with organizations like Balloon, with, um, the, with government, with uh, regional institutions, not with the national institutions. National institutions, the uh, uh, national government needs to provide a framework, but it's very important that these solutions are found in the region with Mapuche people and not for Mapuche people. So those are important concepts, and I think that companies, as you mentioned, companies that are modern, that are successful, that are intelligent, need to incorporate uh, other knowledge, need to incorporate other ex others' expertise. So, so that, is, that, is a, that is a challenge. Um, for us, from a land point of view, we, we own worldwide a lot of hectares. We own about 1.7 million hectares. For us, in, in that area, it's about 50,000 hectares. So it's, it's, it's only 2.5% of, of our land use, but it's our reputation. Um, I'm a Chilean, so this is my country. So this is where I think I can make a bigger difference rather than in, in Canada or, or in the US. So this is, this is an area where I, I devote uh, a good part of my time in trying, trying to prevent difficult situations. We, fortunately, we do not have anyone badly hurt, but this is a dangerous, there's a dangerous area there. There's areas where we do not allow anyone from our company or anyone providing service to our, comp our company to, to go through. So this is a tense moment that we're living in Chile. Learn about it, listen, talk, discuss, invite people that have different points of, points of view it's it's a it's a crucial moment in our in our society, just as as it is the constitution. You, you're going to have the fortune of spending the next few days here. There's going to be an important voting, probably the most important uh, uh, voting moment for the life of of us sitting here that are going to vote. Um, and uh, so learn also take the opportunity of learning about a very interesting process that we've gone through. And, 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 and learn about the process, not so much about the result, because whichever the result is on September 4th, we still have tremendous challenges going forward. Thanks a lot, Charles. I think, I think uh, what um, Charles says to us is one of the main points of discussion today in our country. So thanks, Charles, for your words. And well, maybe, uh, I feel really identified with um, what Florencia worked with. So maybe Florencia, you can share with us how you approach communities, for example, uh, how, how you deal um, with the subjectivity of their perceptions, for example, because this is a topic of discussion in academy, the, the subjectivity of the problem, because we need hard data. So we need numbers. So people don't know what happens. People don't know what is the best for ecosystems. So how do you deal with that? I think that's a very important question uh, for us at the university. And um, to me, because I have to discuss and I am most of the time confronted to that question. So uh, maybe I, it's very important to, to listen to you. Thank you, Claudia, for, for your question. and. I think uh, that thing is a challenge not only for for you, you know, or for all the academic and the university. Is how they they are more involved with the with the community and give us like papers with real data. And for example, in rural areas, um, with the area where we find the forest and those. Things um, we have we have a 
less data, less information, and it's very difficult when when you work with um, uh, governance or, or community development because the people are like very um, uh, are far away. So uh, first, uh, for us, uh, a very important thing is uh, that we have um, a local teams that live in inside the community and they and they uh, talk uh, live and listen and dialogue with the communities and not only with the communities with the company with the majors with the with the other uh, um, uh, social organizations and i think the the key is uh, you you can't um uh, you, you, this uh, for for a, a, a has a good local uh, local governance. You have to to first uh, uh, start with trust, then vinculate, then artic the, then you have to uh, make project make project with them. It's a, a very good um, um, opportunity to to relate it with them from other part not not talk uh, not the first topic is the 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 problems for example a very good um, we use we related with them to project with with his entrepreneurs and then we made the governance not the first time because they have a lot of issues and problems so the governance is a consequence it's not the main, the, so you have to put all your energy in the process. Charles told us in the process, no in the, in, in the outcome, because the outcome is the result for a good process. And um, I think this is the, the, the one you. of the key. Yeah, I, I agree with you from our experience at the university. Well, I think we have 43 uh, seconds. Uh, Maybe, I don't know if, if you want to, we are okay, you have another question, because I think uh, now we have questions uh, from the audience, right? And I should get them. What here. I wanted to say, sorry, is, isn't it beautiful that we are uh, in a building uh, sponsored by a copper company and we have all this wood inside us, so I think this is fantastic. Yeah? <laughs> Okay, so um, we have quest a question, and the question is for Charles. Um, Arauco exports 95% of their products, so how do Arauco returns that to the communities and ecosystems where those products are produced? Good question. Yeah, yeah, good. Our conviction and our commitment in order to develop ourselves from an, uh, an economical point of view was uh, or it has always been around having the size, the, the critical mass, and the competitiveness to go and compete with countries that perhaps some of you represent, such as uh, uh, Sweden, Finland, uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. And for that, we needed to have a size. So um, our, our uh, investments uh, from an industrial point of view are, are very large. We are just concluding the construction of a, of a third line of a pulp mill. It's a $3 billion investment. Um, so our MDF and plywood mills are $250 million investments. We're looking at building an MDF mill in, in Mexico now. Um, and in the case of, of Chile, this is a small country uh, consumption in chile is not that large we also need to leave room for small and medium-sized companies uh, they they do not have the capabilities to export and compete worldwide uh, if we if we would uh, sell all of our products here in chile we would not allow the, we would probably wipe out uh, small and medium-sized uh, companies so there's there is a responsibility there um, the other, from another point of view, is that uh, our wood 
products are manufactured from this fantastic resource, uh, re the only renewable resource that allows uh, uh, large industrial usage of it. So building uh, large buildings, uh, construction, furniture, um, uh, even the textile industry, uh, it, none, none of them can be carried out at a large scale with another renewable resource. And uh, trees are a renewable resource. So we are very, very effective at growing trees. As I said, we plant some 100 million trees a year. We, we have uh, very demanding and competitive uh, silvicultural practices. We do this, we're champions around the world in growing trees. And, um, and we also carry out uh, very interesting work on uh, biodiversity and conservation. So we hold uh, about 270,000 hectares of native forests that are all uh, we've run a full uh, native uh, assess, um, uh, conservation assessment. We're 100% uh, conservation assessment uh, uh, on, on, on what we hold. And, um, and we have, uh, as I mentioned before, we have been incorporating other knowledge and, and society. Uh, activism, NGOs, uh, civil society have also uh, uh, tensed the relationship uh, with us as with other businesses. And we are adapting our practices. We are bringing in, uh, we've incorporated uh, new forestry practices in the last uh, 15 years. Um, certification has helped. Uh, Forest Stewardship Council and uh, PFC and other certifications. So uh, what we leave here, what we bring, we bring all of our profits back to Chile. We invest and we grow. In order to, to grow, we have also expanded to other countries. We, are, we, we provide a lot of employment, and from a corporate social responsibility point of view, as of uh, 10 years ago, we've implemented a shared value approach. So how can, through, how can we solve social issues and at the same time improve the competitiveness of our uh, company, of our, of our business? And um, the fields being education, uh, we... we we have a, a tremendous program around education, not only with schools, but uh, improving the quality of, of, the, of teachers in rural, poor rural areas. Um, also uh, working with leading universities as Universidad Católica in, uh, in technical uh, training and uh, dual education. So we, we've copied a, a model from Germany in order to have people that are studying at the same time work in, in our factories. Um, and uh, housing, housing has been very important. So we have we built, we've helped build about 2,500 houses, also with a shared value approach. Those houses have been built out of wood. In Chile, only recently have we started building with wood products. Uh, most of the construction here is more based on on cement. Uh, so uh, there's a, there's a shared value component uh, in not only providing housing to people that do not have houses, but also those houses are built near where we have our operations and they're made out of wood. So uh, the idea of shared value is something that we're pursuing further and, and further. Uh, and, and we also contribute to society through f philanthropy and, and other activities working together with, with science and academia. Thanks, Charles. Well, we have a Second question for Christian, and um, this is the question. While we speak of moving forward using governance to include and respect indigenous, rural, or pure communities, how do groups like ONAF also account for historical harm for example, reparations or land return. Wow. Wow. Um, a personal opinion? I don't know, really. It's, it's a very complex uh, a question for, for our institution, for for a governmental decision for industry, for, for society, 
because our country is too young. Uh, country is a historical view related to colonization, uh, it's Spain and other uh, industrial colonization, uh, economic colonization and difference. Uh, um, it's, it's very complex to, to respond, but when, when, when I feel that we need to expand our mind, our brain to other, uh, to other culture, other idea, to, 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 to be patient, patient. You have to be patient. To be patient, to, uh, it's too complex to, 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 responder eso es muy complejo pero necesitamos um, diálogo It's mucho diálogo but what we need is dialogue. Uh, mucha política a lot of politics. Eh, resolver con acciones concretas demandas sociales demanda de las culturas to come with concrete actions with uh, uh, social and political uh, demands. Mm. por ejemplo relacionado con la pregunta anterior For example, related to the last question, mm -hmm. la, el, donde se eh, concentra la industria forestal, uh, con, where the forestry industry is concentrated, también está asociado a territorios de mucha demanda social, y los impuestos, por ejemplo, se pagan en, a nivel central. No tenemos una política de descentralización de los impuestos para el desarrollo territorial, por ejemplo. ¿Ah? Governance. ¿Ya? Yeah. No política de descentralizar los impuestos que son pagados. Tampoco tenemos impuestos que, eh, que contribuyan apropiadamente a la carga social eh, que necesitamos. Estamos muy por debajo, de, estamos en 23% del... Del, del, de la carga tributaria. We also don't have taxes that really uh, are meant to contribute to the social things that we need. Y, por ejemplo, hace un par de años atrás se aplicó un impuesto a la, un royalty minero que permitió que mucha, muchos emprendimientos, los FIC regionales, todos los, los desarrollos este, territoriales se puedan aportar con el royalty minero. Por ejemplo, uh, there was just... Um, Uh, tax uh, implemented. Taxes, taxes. Uh, desarrollo territorial. Uh, for territorial development. Y es una forma de, de hacerlo, pero sobre todo diálogo, diálogo, cooperación, abrirse al, al diálogo y soluciones concretas. Taxes are a form to solve it, but most of all uh, we have to think of dialogues. Um, I just said I wanted to hear from Charles as well, because I understand with government run organizations, there's a lot of red tape and a lot of um, challenges. So I, I just wanted to hear from you as well about what you're doing for historical harm. We, we have it within our, our uh, public policy, uh, the relationship with the Mapuche uh, people uh, from a Uh, a cultural point of view, uh, economic and land restoration as well. We have uh, restored uh, 5,000 hectares. We have a compromise for another 10,000 hectares. But this has to go through institutional uh, avenues, institutional uh, organization. And, and there we, we are stuck. Uh, we are stuck because, as uh, Christian was mentioning, um, there's, there's, there's red, and you mentioned red tape, there's, it's complex. Um, and uh, but it's urgent, so so we do we do have uh, a tremendous challenge. You you must understand that uh, a, a company like like ours, we are subject to 
uh, all sorts of uh, regulation. Uh, so we have to be very responsible uh, to, regarding this matter. It's not a question of, of giving out, of making donations. This has to follow uh, a process, which is basically to sell the land uh, to the uh, Chilean state, and the Chilean state then passes this to the community. We have also difficulties with the indigenous uh, law in Chile and communities cannot, uh, cannot rent or divide or sell that land. So it has to be developed as a community. And uh, it sounds very nice, but within the communities, they have many differences. So it's also difficult to determine what do you do with that land once it has been uh, passed on to the, the community. But, and, and it's not only land. I think that, that land does play an important role. Um, if you, we, we just went through an interesting survey done by an organization called SEP. And yes, land, land is there, but it's education, it's dignity, it's culture, it's access to other things, it's infrastructure. Uh, many of these communities uh, do not have access to water. And it's an area where there's a lot of rainfall, particularly during winter, but we do not have the infrastructure to supply water. So it's, it's more than just land. I think land is symbolic, particularly with the Mapuche uh, culture. Uh, it, the word in English is earth. In Spanish, we do not have uh, the translation for earth would be probably planet. We talk about tierra, and tierra is land. And tierra would be the, the same. So, so for Mapuches, it's the earth. Uh, uh, and it's not only the earth from a physical point of view, uh, but also from a, from a symbolical and, and cultural point of view. So uh, now we've used the word complex here. And, and I don't want you to leave with the impression that that is a word that we're going to use every time that we, do, we can't find a solution. Uh, but I, I think that, 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 that we're running against time and we need to work together with government, civil society, and companies, and particularly large companies, and companies that we have a presence there, because we are ready to work together with the Mapuche people in order to find solutions in different areas, because there's not one solution, there's not one size fits all. This has to be, and has to be done with them, and has to be done from there, and not from here, Santiago. And government is very strong here in Santiago. My company is very strong here in Santiago. And we have to try and decentralize and, and, and allow our people, my people in my organization, people that work with me, come up together with Mapuche people with solutions to these problems. Thanks, Charles. I think we have still some seconds. Um, we have a question for all of us. Um, if you had one wish, to come true for the Chilean forest, what would it be? Well, I'd like to respond briefly. Uh, I think we have to discuss about values of forests. I think uh, because um, values uh, is a very important aspect and uh, conflicts maybe uh, are related to different values uh, that different groups of people gives up um, identify from forests. I don't know if would you like to say maybe Florence. I'll start. One word. Pride. We in Chile needs to f need to feel proud about our forests. And w and let me tell you, I feel very proud. But and we probably here feel very proud. But Chileans do not know about forests, they don't know about uh, uh, the wonders that we have. With, there's a lot of degradation, there's a lot of uh, illegal wood, uh, wood being used as, 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 as firewood, um, and, and CONAF needs to spend a lot of time and a lot of resources in, in policing so that, uh, and, and controlling so that that does not happen. Um, I, I think Chile, as I mentioned to you at the beginning of my presentation and with the video, I think the, the journey has been just fantastic. We've managed to, to restore ecosystems, protect, and at the same time develop a wood industry uh, for the demands of the world, uh, not only Chile, 
we're working hard in Chile in order to promote more use of wood. Uh, it, this is the only renewable uh, product that, as I said, can can um, can face large industrial uh, uh, projects. And uh, so I want packaging made out of wood rather than made out of plastic. I want houses built out of wood rather than made out of cement or steel. Uh, and I want textile. I want clothes made out of wood rather than uh, polyester. Um, and this is the only, as as you all well know, this is the only industrial machine that we have that captures CO, CO2. There is no other, nothing else has been invented yet. Eh? So this is done at a, at, a, at a large scale, and Chile is very well positioned to continue having a leadership role in the world in, in those aspects. Thanks, Charles. Well, I think um, we have to finish now, and thanks a lot for this very interesting and important discussion, and thanks to you for coming to this uh, governance uh, session. Hi, everyone. Thank you to the speakers, to Claudia for moderating this space. Um, we have a space. Ah, we can uh, take a picture. We find the IPSA flag. So, good news, Simone. Outside of the auditorium, there will be a list for every workshop theme, so you can register it on the best you want. And those are planned to um, go deeper into one uh, um, into each of the sectors that were spoken uh, today. So uh, you can put your name on any list if you want. And we have free time until the launch. So maybe we can do something together, but we can discuss it um, outside. So, okay. Uh, launch is um, at 10 minutes before 2 p.m. And it would be in the economy faculty, but you can follow OC members for it. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs>